Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Francisca Awambuli, a survivor of labor and sex trafficking, and almost a victim of organ trafficking. Five years ago, I was in a sparkling large modern house. It was very different than the home where I grew up in Cameroon. At home, my mother cooked delicious meals over an open pit fire while the children played outside. The love that I felt there was very different than what I experienced in this house. After going to college and getting part way through a master's degree in Norway, I was trafficked to Kuwait. Forced to do work that I never agreed to and was never paid for. In this sparkling large modern house, I was in slavery. But that wasn't the end of my story. It was the beginning. I was lucky to be able to return home to Cameroon and help other women who have been enslaved or are vulnerable. Through the organization I founded, Survivors Network, women have access to empowerment programs and vocational training. Some have started their own businesses, while others have found employment in their communities. Women are able to find alternatives working abroad and putting themselves at risk of being exploited. This is what it means to me to fight for home. For our next conversation, we are proud to welcome an icon. Dolores Huerta has been fighting for her community for most of her life. When she saw the students of farm workers in her community come to school hungry, she fought better conditions. When she saw those workers get injured on the job, she successfully fought to get them disability insurance. And when farmers in California refused to pay their workers minimum wage, she helped found the United Farm Workers of America and led a movement that won them better wages and the right to organize. Dolores will be joined on stage by one of the Obama Foundation's community leadership core members from right here in Chicago, Oscar Sanchez. Though just in his 20s, he is already working to ensure communities on the southwest side are counted in next year's census. Their conversation will be moderated by author and journalist Sarah Smash. In her book, Heartland, she shares powerful stories of her roots in Kansas, of a working class struggling to prosper, of a home worth fighting for. Please welcome on stage Oscar Sanchez, Dolores Huerta, and Sarah Smash. Thank you, thank you, thank you ma'am. Hello, everyone. So I'd like to start with a question for Ms. Huerta. We might think of our world as two distinct geographic parts, one being disadvantaged places that are negatively stereotyped, and we're encouraged to get out of or avoid those places, and the other being spots that have greater access to privilege and power. Since sometimes people don't cross the line there between, and you yourself have always turned toward rather than away from disadvantaged spaces, what about struggling communities might surprise more privileged people who have not witnessed it firsthand? Well, I, I think I was very fortunate in growing up because I grew up in a kind of a farming community called Stockton, California. and. Uh, this was uh, after the Depression uh, in the 30s. And in my community, I was so fortunate because we had so many different ethnic groups. Uh, my next door neighbors were Italian immigrants. People catty corner were Greek immigrants. Uh, we had Filipino immigrants. Uh, we had Chinese, Japanese, uh, actually somebody from Afghanistan. And of course, my next door neighbors were African American. And I think that I was so privileged to, to be able to grow up with all of these different uh, ethnic groups and diversity. Mm. And I feel sorry for people that don't, do not have that experience. Mm. Because I think once you grow up with, uh, with different cultures, uh, that it, it just prepares you for life. And, mm. and sometimes uh, somebody asked me once, 
about our president. I think he never had that privilege mm. of uh, talking about the President Trump. He never had that privilege mm. to grow up with different people, especially people of color. And because I think that does, uh, you know, when you have, you have that opportunity, mm -hmm. it just prepares you for life. Yeah. So it's, I'm hearing you as saying that places that are thought of as not being worldly actually might be very sophisticated in, in ways that... Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Oscar, a question for you. I, as a journalist and writer, often think about how our place shapes our language. That might have to do with ethnicity and culture, but also even dialect and class, uh, who has access to education and certain vocabularies. Sometimes activism can be a, a middle class or upper middle class enterprise, and well-meaning people might be using words that create kind of barriers between themselves and those that they seek to empower. So with your work on the ground right here in Chicago, uh, working to empower communities toward representation in the 2020 census, uh, what are you learning and seeing and employing about effective communication? So I think it all starts with being authentic, like being really yourself. So I'm from the South Side, um, and a lot of people don't say that, oh, you sound like you're from the South Side. Um, so the first thing with that is always like, effective communication always starts with effective listening. So making sure that you know the community you're working with, and you have to understand them. It's not like you're introducing a solution to a community, but you're introducing a community, uh, you're introducing the community to a solution. Um, and it's about leading them towards it and working together with them. Especially in the census, I'm learning how to get rid of, let's get rid of all this jargon, that these terms that people don't understand, and break them down and make sure they understand what we're trying to do. Um, because I come from a community that were really misrepresented, and it's making them understand how they're misrepresented and making sure that they understand that we're lacking resources. But it's always about communicating that and being really transparent with your agenda. It's saying, like, we are here to help. We're here to, not from like this complex of savior, right? We're here literally because I come from the same problems that you're facing. So just being authentic at the end of the day. Mm. Do you want to add anything to that, Dolores? Oh, yeah. I think the whole thing about um, democracy to begin with, uh, that it doesn't work unless people participate. Exactly. And the people that do need to participate are the, the poor people and working people. And sometimes they don't think that they have the power, uh, that they, can, they, they can't make any difference. So the main thing that we have to do when we organize is to explain to people, you do have power. Even if you don't have a lot of money, even if you don't have a, 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 a you might say, a, an education going to college, et cetera, but the fact that you have the power in your person. And if we get people to understand that, that this is all the power that you need, but also to know that you can't do it alone. But if all of us come together and we take direct action, this is the way that we make the changes. And we don't need anybody to come and do it for us. And in fact, what people have to understand, if you don't do this, it's not going to change. So we have a responsibility, each and every one of us, that we've got to participate, we've got to be involved. And I know a lot of people, you know, they have to work, or students have school, they have family problems. But I like to say to people, you know what? If you get involved civically and you get engaged, those problems that you have, they're going to resolve themselves anyway, okay? They're going to go away. Because, and then you, when, because when you're actually helping other people, then all your problems d diminish and, and, you, and you're distracted from your problems but you, because you, you know you're doing some good and trying to make a change in the world mm -hmm. and in your community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have been affecting that change in communities for so long, across so many decades, that I was thinking about how so many people in this room, many of them young people, um, you know, are, are world changers. They, they are out to make a difference. Many of them are at the beginning of their journeys. I recently interviewed a, um, a young woman who's the daughter of farm workers in the Central Valley, and she now works as a first-generation college graduate for the Uf United Farm Workers Foundation. Uh, and she was telling me a story about how her teenage brother, in fairly recent memory, uh, almost died of heat stroke in the fields. And I was thinking, so much progress has been made, and yet we all recognize in this room that we still live in a world where race, class, gender, and other markers affect your chances in life. So I know you get asked this question frequently, but as someone who has, has found the spirit to stay in it for so long, in spite of setbacks, uh, what would you impart to, to Oscar and his peers about the long fight? Well, uh, the journey for justice is a, lo a long one. And I think the main thing we have to do is you know, stick and keep our eye on the prize. But one thing that I have been sharing with people, because so much of the, you might say, the oppression and the fact that people are suffering comes from this disease of racism. Dr. Martin Luther King said that racism is an illness, it's a sickness. 
And so we have to see ourselves as healers. And one of the things that I love to say to audiences is just to remember that we are one human race, homo sapiens. And we have to remember where did our race begin? Our human race began in Africa. What does that mean? That means that, that means that we are all Africans of different shades and colors. And so we can say to the, you know, all the KKKs, the white nationalists, get over it, you're Africans, okay? Enough already, just stop it. <laughs> And Oscar, what question, just to kind of flip that, that coin, uh, what question would you ask of Dolores Huerta? So I, I think it's really important to empower individuals. So I was wondering, how can we as individuals, as siblings, as parents, as a community, how can we encourage uh, the next generation, how can we encourage youth to be more civically engaged and more civically responsible? Well, I think we have to make them understand that youth is actually, uh, they are, are the leaders not only of the future, but also of the present. And we have sen seen this now with so many young people uh, fighting to you know, g get gun control, uh, fighting uh, to make sure that we can uh, make people uh, understand that we have global warming. And so a lot of young people are our current leaders, but we have to invite them in. Because a lot of people don't get involved and nobody ever invites them to join. And right now we're, we're working on the census and we're asking people to please get involved in your neighborhood because each one of us that does, does not get counted, we are going to lose thousands and thousands and millions of dollars if people of color do not get counted. And we've got to tell them, don't be afraid. There's not going to be a, a citizenship, citizenship question on, on the census, okay? And if, if anybody tries to share any information, they can go to prison for five years or get a $250,000 fine. But if we don't all get involved in making people understand, you've got to get counted because the money from the federal government goes into your community, depending on how many, how many of us are in that community. And also we will lose congressional seats, we will lose representation if people of color do not get counted. And how is your foundation, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, handling the census specifically? Well, right now we are doing as much outreach as we can. We're trying to set up neighborhood committees and so that people will volunteer to say, I will go into my neighborhood and I will canvass my neighborhood to make sure that everybody here gets counted. So we're working on this right now. We're not waiting till, waiting till March of 2020 when the questionnaires come out. We've got to start doing that organizing right now because in the Latino community, there's a lot of fear. You know, when Donald Trump came down on that elevator and attacked Mexicans, you know, and attacked, and he's continued to do that. And so a lot of undocumented people have a lot of fear. And so we're saying to them, don't be afraid. That information cannot be shared. So we need you to get counted. And Oscar, you're very directly engaged in that work right now in Chicago. I, I don't mean to out you, but backstage we were talking about it. And he said, you know, at first blush, I'll be honest, it sounded kind of boring, the census. Um, but you found that that was an incredibly um, dynamic springboard to a host of other issues. If you could just talk to um, the, the importance that you witness in some very specific ways for being counted. Yeah, so like I said, um, specifically to the census and like every one of us in this room, uh, in some way we're misrepresented. And that's the whole root with when we came up to it. We were thinking, how can we encourage youth? And that's the whole motive of the team. And we're like, okay, so we're like, how can we ensure that these communities are getting the resources they need? And that's what led us to the census. And we, the more we started digging, the more we saw that for many years, uh, especially the black community has been misrepresented. We, there was a study in 2010 that there was a projected 2 million black males missing from the census. And we think of all the communities in Chicago that are predominantly black, that the resources are, they're not there. So we're like, how can we make sure and ensure that these communities, they're not falling apart? Um, so that's what really kept motivating us. And that's, that, that's, hearing things like that just makes you want to work more and more to make sure that we're helping um, everyone, the ones that are affected the most, and we're affected the most. Even when we were talking with the Latin community, I'm part of the Latin community, and we're scared, but it's ensuring safety, ensuring that they want us to be scared so we're not accounted for, but we want to be accounted for because we are here. Like, we are here. And we have to make them know that we're here. We have to make them know that we're going to be empowered to make sure that we get what we need to help our people. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, away from the, the specifics of activism to just think about the spirit that, that motivates it or activates it. Um, I grew up on a wheat farm in southern Kansas doing, um, learn, and learned how to do the country two-step at rodeos. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are a lifelong dancer mm -hmm. um, from a different culture and, and a different tradition. And I was thinking about how dance is... Um, it, it, is of, it is specific to a place. It is very much of a place and a culture, and yet is transcendent in its ability to bring people together mm -hmm. uh, in a moment of, of revelry or celebration. So I was wondering if you could reflect, uh, Ms. Huerta, on um, what we activists could learn from a dance floor. Well, I, th I think that the, the, the organizing work is so difficult because you're trying to uh, give it a people's apathy. You're trying to give them power, trying to make them understand that they can make changes. And so uh, when we think of, of that kind of work, then you also need to have some kind of joy in the process. I mean, it, you know, like during the civil rights movement, there were a lot of freedom songs, you know. And if people uh, can I get out there and dance, I think it kind of uh, it makes you uh, get rid of some of the tensions that you have. But also, I think dancing is very important. I'm going on 90 uh, years. Next, next year, I'll be 90 years old. I think, uh, and, and, uh, but I can walk, so I can still walk pretty good. And I like to say to all young people, dance a lot because your legs are going to get stronger. And then when you get my age, uh, then also, you know, you can still dance. And so we have to bring joy into the work that we do so that we don't get the burnout, you know. Uh, we have to have fun uh, while, we're, while, 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 while we're making it happen. And, uh, but this work that we need to do right now in organizing is just so crucial. With my organization, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, uh, not only are we working on uh, communities to empower them to take power, run for the school board, get elected, run for the water board, run for city council, run, run for the Congress. Uh, people have to take power. Like Reverend Jim Lawson says, we've got to dismantle the systems of oppression, but we've got to have fun while we're doing it at the yeah. same time. We've got, we've, got to, we've got to stop the school to prison pipeline, which is another thing that we're working on, uh, suing our school district uh, who actually uh, they actually expelled 2,600 uh, African American and Latino students. This is down in Bakersfield, Kevin McCarthy's district, okay? 2,600 African American and Latino students in one year. Well, we sued them. That number has gone from 2,600 to 26, okay? But we've got we've to gotta do that work at the grassroots level uh, so that we can uh, change the conditions and to create the, uh, create the country and the world that President Obama wanted to create. We've got to continue that struggle. Thank you. Uh, and Oscar, to, to turn back to you on kind of on that same question, we were talking backstage about uh, your relationship to where you come from and your family, and yet you have this activist spirit which can present sometimes as very serious or heavy to people that aren't engaged in the fight. So on that same question about joy and what activates you as somebody very early in your journey, while you've already accomplished so much, uh, in your early 20s, setting out uh, many decades ahead of you um, uh, in the fight for justice. How, what's your relationship to this idea about just sort of a, a joyful spirit to be brought to the work? Oh, man, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, it's tough because, like, I feel like there's always this pressure from the, the older generation to, like, you have to be doing this, you have to do this. And then I always remind myself, like, like Dolores said, like, this work takes a long time. So why am I going to burn myself out? and not encourage or motivate other people to be involved in the work, um, I, I'm not gonna do that. I, we just have to encourage more people and have a good time. I, people know I'm not that serious. People I group knows that I laugh at everything. I joke about everything. Um, you have to just be this free spirit when it comes to like enjoy life. And when you're enjoying life, you're basically, you're kind of like giving a middle finger to the oppressor at the end of the day, because it's like, I'm living life still and I'm not gonna let anything turn me down. So I, mean, I think that's my best response. Well said, well said. Um, so, so we're out of time, actually. And I think that um, Ms. Huerta wanted to, to end with maybe engaging the audience directly. Yes, well, uh, I want to ask the audience a question. And I know, the, you, I know you know the answer, but I want you to do the answer all, all together, OK? And my question is a really simple one. I'm going to ask you two questions. I'm going to ask you, don't answer yet, OK? I'm going to ask you. <laughs> 
I'm going to ask you who's got the power, and I want you to say, we've got the power. And when I say what kind of power, I want you to say people power. But I want us to shout it so loud that all of those neo-Nazis, homophobes, uh, <laughs> climate deniers, misogynists, uh, sexual harassers, okay, uh, the bigots, so they can hear us. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's, okay, let's go. Who's got the power? We got the power. What kind of power? People power. So are we going to continue the journey for justice? And we will say it in uh, President Obama's words. Yes, we can. Let's all do it with an organized hand clap. Let's go. Yes, yes we, we can. can.